a KQED HD production. Scientists from around the world spent 10 years building the biggest atom smasher ever created. They built this gigantic new machine in Switzerland to find answers to the most fundamental questions about the universe. You want to know what are the basic building blocks out of which the entire universe is made and what glues those building blocks together? What are the forces that hold them together? At the start of the 20th century, physicists realized that microscopes wouldn't be enough to observe what makes up the atom. So instead, they created devices that use electromagnetic fields to propel subatomic particles to high enough energies to reveal what's inside them or to create new particles. Though known in popular culture as atom smashers, particle accelerators actually smash particles that are inside the atom, like protons or electrons. Today, the most famous one is the Large Hadron Collider, so big that its 17-mile underground tunnel straddles the border between Switzerland and France. Activated in 2008, it cost billions of dollars and involves 13,000 scientists and students from 50 countries. They're trying to further our understanding of some of the most basic questions of physics. What's the atom made of? It's made of a nucleus and electron. What's the nucleus made of? It's made of a proton and a neutron. What are the proton and neutrons made of? They're made of quarks. What's the quark made of? We don't know. Since the 1930s, physicists in Northern California have played key roles in finding answers to these questions and in building particle accelerators that paved the way for the Large Hadron Collider. It's a Bay Area phenomenon in some ways. I really think that a lot of these basic concepts of accelerators started here in the Bay Area, you know, both at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where I am, and over at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. The Bay Area's history of particle accelerator research began on the UC Berkeley campus in 1930, when 29-year-old physicist Ernest Lawrence designed a circular particle accelerator. His cyclotron was a breakthrough because without requiring much energy, it could produce very energetic particles in a small space. Up until that point, the energies were so low that it was hard to excite uh, nuclei and really see what they're made of. What do they do when they spin up? What do they do when they heat up? Lawrence's first cyclotron fit in the palm of his hand. The machine's second iteration fit on a table. To get the charged particles moving fast, Lawrence bent them into a circular path using two magnets like this one. Then he gave the particles regular pushes to increase their velocity. Timing when you give it that kick or that nudge is, that's of essence, that's the important part of a, about a cyclotron. If you're taking a child to the park, as you give them that nudge on the swing, uh, if you mistime that, you can either slow the child down or you can just do nothing because you, you, you missed uh, being able to impart and increase their velocity at all. The cyclotron reached an energy level that allowed Lawrence and his colleagues to easily investigate the nucleus of an atom for the first time. To do this, they bombarded charged particles against different elements. By adding protons to the target nucleus, they created new elements. During World War II, Lawrence turned the cyclotron into a device that could separate out the type of uranium necessary to produce the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It is a legacy of nuclear physics that our forefathers were instrumental in making nuclear weapons possible. And now we, we live with that for good or for bad. Besides helping usher in the atomic age, they inaugurated the field of nuclear medicine. In fact, most cancer patients who undergo radiation therapy today do so in an accelerator. For his invention of the cyclotron, Lawrence received the 1939 Nobel Prize in Physics. Today, the laboratory Ernest Lawrence started on the UC Berkeley campus is the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. 
Its cyclotron is one of two facilities in California used to test the computer chips that go into satellites. The cyclotron emulates the high radiation that satellite electronics encounter in space. To do so, they bombard the chips with charged atoms called ions. Today we have copper, yttrium, silver, terbium, neon, argon, tantalum, xenon, and krypton. Control room. Yes, can I have a xenon, please? Xenon, coming up. When the computer chip fails, the tester has found its maximum radiation tolerance. In their effort to discover smaller and smaller levels of matter, physicists built ever more fanciful accelerators. In 1962, in Menlo Park, construction began on the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. At two miles, its accelerator was the longest in the world. Linear accelerators, also referred to as LINAX, push particles in a straight line as opposed to a circle. When it turned on in 1966, the new LINAX mission was to find out what was inside the protons and neutrons that make up the atom's nucleus. One of the very early experiments was to take the beam from the linear accelerator, which was the highest energy electron beam in the world, and shoot it into a target that was made of protons and neutrons. And if the proton, say, was a nice uniform bag of jelly, then you would see that the trajectory of the electron deflected, but not by much. On the other hand, if the proton was like jam, if it had seeds of jam, then every once in a while that point-like electron would hit a seed in the proton, and it would come out scattered at a big angle. The physicists found that there were indeed seeds in the jam. The protons and neutrons were made of something smaller, which scientists named quarks. Not only were they smaller, but they were even weirder than that, because instead of having one unit of charge like the electron has and the proton has, they had fractional units of charge, charges of one third, two thirds, what are those things doing there? Immediately the question became, how many quarks are there? This new question would require a new type of accelerator. Physicist Burton Richter pioneered the idea of a collider and in 1972 built one attached to the Stanford LINAC. Instead of smashing particles against a stationary target, as the LINAC did, the so-called Spear Collider smashed beams of accelerated particles against each other. What happens when you go bowling and you roll a bowling ball down? Only a small part of the energy gets transferred to all the pins. Now, if you think of rolling two bowling balls at each other, you're going to turn all the energy into interaction energy. This energy was then available to create new subatomic particles. As Albert Einstein outlined in his famous equation, mass can transform into energy, and energy can transform into mass. If you smash particles against each other, the resulting energy will transform into mass, that is, particles. The Spear Collider was so good at this that it helped shed light on the question of the number of quarks. Many physicists in the early 70s believed that only three types of quarks existed. The up and down quarks made up ordinary matter, the stuff that we and our planet are made of. One more, dubbed the strange quark, was produced in accelerators. In 1974, two years after turning on the Spear Collider, Richter and his team found something unexpected. We discovered something that wasn't supposed to be there. Richter's team had found a heavy particle made up of a fourth type of quark. His discovery of this so-called charm quark won Richter the 1976 Nobel Prize in Physics and paved the way for a theory to explain how matter is organized. There is no question that Spear hit the jackpot. In a series of experiments between uh, Burt's discovery in 74 and the early 80s established what we now call the standard model of particle physics. It's our understanding of how the world works at its most basic and fundamental level 
And this is work that's going to stand for hundreds of years. The charm quark and other fundamental particles like it are rare today. We have to make them in accelerators or look for them in space. But 14 billion years ago, at the time of the Big Bang, they were everywhere. Their interactions determined how the universe evolved in the first moments after its birth. Where do we see them now? We see them now in supernova explosions. We see them now in cosmic rays, which bombard us all the time. It took physicists decades to drill deep down into the atom and discover its smallest parts. But it turns out that all this ordinary matter makes up less than 5% of the universe. An invisible matter that scientists refer to as dark matter is much more plentiful. And this we know by looking at galaxies, things like rotating galaxies, you have to have enough mass in them to keep them from falling apart. We can measure the visible mass, and it wouldn't hold these spiral galaxies together. They would just fly apart. The question is, what is the dark matter? We think that it's made out of a kind of very massive particle that's very hard to produce. Which brings us back to the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland. It takes the concept behind the Spear Collider and smashes particles together. Only the collisions produce an energy level about 1,000 times higher, which the international team hopes will be enough to create dark matter. The Bay Area's accelerators are not, for the most part, being used anymore to study the building blocks of matter. They now serve as powerful microscopes to examine things like proteins. But the original goal of their creators is very much alive today. You know, my, my feeling is that if uh, Ernest Lawrence were alive today, what Ernest Lawrence would be doing is traveling off to uh, Geneva to the Large Hadron Collider. And, uh, I, I'm sure that what he would have found that so exciting just to be there and take part in that experiment. <laughs>